Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with our most beautiful melodies in the world. This is the third in an ongoing series, and I've tried to do a bunch of them all at once just so I can get it started and so that I can, I can mention some of your picks um, and, of course, start the whole ball rolling here for the following year, for 2021, because today is Christmas Day 2020, and I want to wish you all the very, very best for the holidays. And if you're watching this in July of 2375, what can I tell you? You know when we did this historically. What a dismal year it's been been? Has it not? My goodness. The pandemic is raging and everybody is, is sequestered and basically miserable. But we have each other. We have our music. We have our families. We have our pets. Right, people? I know. Go have fun over there. She's sitting over there watching us. And, you know, things could be worse. What can I tell you? Uh, I, I'm just so delighted to be able to be here and present these chats. And I am so grateful, as I've said before, for the fact that you join me in these and that you've submitted your own suggestions for the most beautiful melody in the world, in your opinion. Um, and there is no right or wrong with this. They are quite an assortment. And I'm going to talk about two of them. Now, the first one comes from Dale Hurwitz. Well, this was sort of a parental obligation one because Dale Hurwitz is my mother. And I really have to do this, <laughs> not just because her birthday's coming up in a few days and I'm not going to say how old she is, but because if I don't do it, I'm going to be in big, big trouble. And you should all know this. You know, my mother watches every single video that I do and she reads every single comment. You know, when we talk about these things, she doesn't talk about the videos. She calls me up and she talks about the comments. <laughs> so, so watch out because if you aren't nice, you're going to have to deal with mom and you don't want that. Believe me. My, my mother, let me just tell you a few things to get started here. My mother is the coolest mom probably that ever lived. I mean, and, and of course, everyone says that about their mother unless they were like, you know, evil and horrible. But but I, I'm not kidding. My mother was like the mother that everybody went to, even um, if she wasn't their mother because she was everyone's mother. You know what I mean? There's always like one of those in the neighborhood. That was my mother. She was the mother of us all, as Virgil Thompson said in his opera by Gertrude Stein. And uh, what an astonishing life she's had. I mean, my mom, my mom was a, a teacher for her entire career. She got another master's degree while she was teaching in history. She became an adjunct professor uh, for at Southern Connecticut State College, where she was responsible for running the teacher certification program for this for the state of Connecticut, basically. Uh, you know, really, and with all of that, you know, going on, she raised three kids and had dinner on the table every day at six o'clock. You know, we, we don't credit, I think, I think women particularly for their unbelievable competence and ability to juggle things and organize life. And it's just really, really a remarkable person. And not the least of which was uh, of her accomplishments, if accomplishment it was, was that my mother really got me into classical music. If you saw the video I did about my dad, who was actually the musically talented one, he played the piano, but hated it <laughs> and didn't want to have anything to do with it because of the way the way it was forced on him when he was a kid. My mother taught me to love this stuff and she did it in the best way possible. I mean, in, 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 my mother was, it was an educator, an educator down to her, 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 her toes and fingertips and in, in, in everything she did. And it was just such a natural, natural thing. And the way I picked up classical music was from her record collection, uh, mostly when she did housework. <laughs> For the most part, we had classical music always to housework. Dusting was always the can-can from Offenbach's Gaete Parisienne. Um, you could not dust without the can-can going. And the other two big pieces were Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, um, which you know, she taught me the words, you know, I'm sure some of you know them, you know, this is the symphony that Schubert never finished. You know, that was, that was vacuuming or straightening up in one way, but major, major housework, long projects. 
was Brahms' first symphony. This is my mother's favorite piece of music. It really is. And she wrote to me. She wrote to me as a comment and asked that I, that I present the big tune from the finale of Brahms' first symphony. And I am not going to say no. No way am I saying no. Let me, let me read to you what she wrote, because I think, I think it's very, very telling. She writes, I feel a certain measure of entitlement as David's mom. My favorite tune is the finale of Brahms First, which I played almost every day. I think it goes well with household chores and grading papers. It has a special finish to it that I love. Well, I can only agree. I mean, that was my experience growing up. But I think the thing that separates her vision of the classics from a lot of people that I know is that growing up, they were such a normal part of our life. I mean, when she talks about grading papers and doing housework, I know some people would go, oh God, the classics. You know, they're supposed to be listened to with complete attention, with folded hands, you know, sitting there with you know, monumental silence. Certainly you're not running the vacuum cleaner while they're going. But the, the, the point that she made was that this is just a wonderful part of our normal existence. And that's how it's always been for me. And that's what I try to convey in doing these chats with you too, that this music is, yes, it can be a special occasion. Yes, it's high art, it's all of those things. But, but to make it a part of your life, you have to adopt a certain attitude of normalcy to the whole, the whole enterprise. And that's what, that's what mom always had when it came to this music. Listening to Brahms first was as natural for her as, as going to, you know, a football game wrapped in a blanket and watching my brother, you know, play football in the snow up at Colgate University where he was on the football team. I mean, my mother was a sports freak. She knew more about sports than anyone in the world. That's why my father married her. And she still is. She can talk about Brahms just as easily as she can talk about baseball and football statistics. There's no difference. It's all just, just part of, part of life, part of living a good life of seeking out the best, the most enjoyable, the, in the most natural way. And that's, that's what mom gave me. And I don't think there's a more precious gift that, that any parent can give a child. I really don't. I, 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 I can't even imagine where I would be had it not been for her. And it wasn't just classical music. She liked all kinds of music. You know, she liked Randy Newman. She liked Harry Belafonte. She listened to the Weavers. We listened to Peter, Paul, and Mary. She really loved Broadway musicals. I mean, in addition to Schubert's Unfinished, I mean, we had to listen. <laughs> we couldn't imagine housework, a normal day of housework without the roar of the grease paint or paint your wagon or Pippin. Just, just one wonderful and life-enhancing experience after another involving music, and because it was just such a, a a normal part of our lives when I started to get into it. I mean, it was my mother's record collection that got me into classical music. The first piece that really hit me being the Steinberg Pittsburgh recording of Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, which a bunch of you have mentioned, I've noticed. So maybe we'll do some of that too in the future. But wow, I mean, what a, what a wonderful gift. So, so I have to say thank you, mom. And it is with enormous pleasure that I play this recording featuring the Czech Philharmonic under Carol Anschel on Superfun of the finale the big tune at the start of the finale, the first subject from Brahms' first symphony. I know we all know it, but let's listen to it with some of the, the love and naturalness that I grew up believing that this piece always had. <laughs>
I have to tell you one particular story about this tune that was quite wonderful. Um, when I was a kid, my, my parents took me to see the Israel Philharmonic under Zubin Mehta. They came to New Haven. They were playing in Woolsey Hall at Yale University, which is a wonderful hall, by the way, for any of you who've been there. And, and they were doing Brahms first. And the program because it was the Israel Philharmonic, it was a it was a concert that was done in association with like, you know, the United Jewish Appeal or some sort of charitable thing. I mean, I was a little kid. I don't remember all of that part clearly, but it was like a big event in 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 the Jewish life of of the greater New Haven area. So everyone showed up, even people who were really not terribly into classical music, just because it was the Israel Philharmonic under Zubin Mehta. It was a big deal. And they began the program with some really kind of terrible modern piece by an Israeli composer. I even remember the title. It was called In Aeus Memoriam. And I don't remember who wrote it, but I remember the title. And I remember it. Why? Because as a nascent percussionist, it had a thunder sheet. And looking at the back of the orchestra was this enormous piece of metal hanging up on the back wall. And of course, you'd shake it. It would go, rawr, 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 you know, it was it was one of these Holocaust memorial pieces that, you know, people are now doing like 9-11 memorial pieces. And they're already starting to write pandemic memorial pieces. You know, they're all they're all sort of equal opportunities for music of of extraordinary pretense and and a minimum of of artistic value. I mean, how do I say it better than that? I mean, if you ever listen to like John Adams Pulitzer Prize winning winning thing that he did for the 9-11 thing on the transmigration of souls, oh, horrible. I mean, you know, there, there's, there's, there's no way that people are going to successfully capture the horror of those events in a tidy little musical piece that opens a concert. And this piece, in addition to having the thunder sheet at the climax, had a siren, like an air raid siren that went off. And when that siren went off, a bunch of people got up and ran for the exits, which I thought was hysterically funny. But anyway, during the Brahms first, because there were lots of people there who don't normally attend these things, they, they some guy fell asleep. I, I don't know where he was exactly. I think at a balcony. And he woke up in the middle of the slow movement and started applauding madly, having no idea where he was and thinking he was missing out on it. And of course, the applause immediately horrified everyone who was sitting there. Zubin Mehta turned around and stared up at it with like daggers in his eyes. And I just remember the first violin section just cracking up. They all just lost it. <laughs> they didn't stop playing, but they were all laughing. And it was, it was other than that, quite, quite a, a memorable recording, um, a recording, performance, a live event, my first live encounter with the first symphony of Brahms. So let's move on to the next selection because this is a double header. I wanted to give you something that's extremely familiar with something that may be less so. And that less so comes, let me get this here, from Mr. Magnus, Magnus Crook. Magnus Crook, yes. And it's, his suggestion is, O oh, malheureuse Iphigenie, from Gluck's Iphigenie en Tauride, Iphigenia in Taurus. He writes, this is a soaring, wistful, and yet luxuriously caressing melody, which is almost like a folk tune in its apparent simplicity. And I want to stress something. I want to tell you something about this tune and this piece. It is amazing. I mean, the title, of course, means, oh, unhappy Iphigenia. And so that's all you need to know about the words. It's about how miserable she is. <clears throat> but Gluck got this tune originally from his earlier opera, an opera seria called La Clemenza di Tito, which you will all know because that was Mozart's last opera. He set the same basic libretto, although Mozart claimed the libretto was taken in hand and, and de baroqueized to turn it into a real opera. I actually like the Baroque version better because it, it actually gives more characters, more opportunities to sing good stuff. And one of the great arias, I mean, a smash hit, from Gluck's La Clemenza di Tito, um, was an aria called Si mai senti spirarti sul volto, which basically means, let me get rid of this glare thing here, I don't have to read anymore, which basically means when I feel your breath on my face. That's the aria. And it was a classic Baroque opera seria aria, a da capo aria in A, B, A form. And the melody, which became 
O malheureuse Iphigenie, when Gluck reused it for the 1779 Paris version of Iphigenie en Torlid, that melody was the A section of the aria. But even back then, it was, I think, in the 1750s when he originally wrote La Clemenza de Tito, that aria took the musical world by storm, blew everybody away. And it, first of all, because of its harmonic audacity, but more to the point, the main aria, this melody that that Mr. Crook has so wonderfully suggested that we play, I'm so happy to see this and that I have a recording that I can play you. Hmm. Um, the, the amazing thing about this piece is that the, the melody has an amazing structure. Apparent simplicity is what Magnus said, and Magnus is right because this is a completely non-repeating tune. It begins at the beginning and goes on and never, ever repeats anything <laughs> at all. It's one continuous melody. It is as potent and compelling an example of endless melody as Wagner ever wrote. It really is. It's astonishing that in 1779, someone was doing this. The result sounds absolutely timeless and in its way, extremely modern. It's amazing. And in this setting, in recasting this as a, a single number without the B section that the Baroque opera Syria had, what Gluck did was add a chorus of priestesses at the climax. The women's chorus comes in behind the voice in an absolutely thrilling, thrilling sonic panorama and voice and chorus, eventually just the chorus, bring the piece to a close. It lasts about three and a half minutes. And as I said, it is one continuous, non-repetitive melody. I, I can't even begin to describe how astonishing that is and how amazing it still sounds. So I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to play O Malheureuse Iphigenie. This is the Orfeo recording, which I have sitting here. There it is. Uh, featuring Pilar Lorangar, who is not, or Lorangar, if you want to call it that way. Pilar Lorangar, who is really not the best voice for this part, but it's okay. You'll get the idea with Lamberto Gardelli on Orfeo. The other people in this recording are our Franco Bonasoli and Dietrich Fischer Dieskal. It's an excellent cast. Gluck's operas are still not really well understood, not performed as often as they should be, certainly not fully appreciated in the way that they were back in the day. People talk about their their revolutionary qualities, you know, because he, he banished the conventions of opera Syria in favor of this sort of continuous melody, the Wagnerian ideal um, that he was already doing back in 1770. And Wagner, of course, knew it and tried to co-opt the, the Gluckian aesthetic by making an arrangement of Gluck's other Iphigenia opera, Iphigenie and Aulis, you know, because Iphigenia really got around, you know, she was, she's all over the place. You know, you can find her in Mozart's Idomeneo too. I mean, Iphigenia, where, where there is not an Iphigenia, there is no Baroque opera. But anyway, you know, this is really magnificent music. And what gets me about it is not the, you know, revolutionary qualities. It's, 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 it's what Magnus says. It's, it's expressivity, the just exquisitely beautiful, ongoing, lyrical outpouring. It's astonishing. So here it is.
That was Gluck's aria, O Malheureuse Iphigenie, from Iphigenie en Tauride, the French version. There's a German version, too. There's, there's Iphigenie auf Tauris. Anyway, an incredible, incredible piece of music that I am thrilled to have the opportunity to share with you in this chat about the world's most beautiful melodies. Keep sending me your suggestions. I know we're, they're piling up, but we're going to work our way through the pile. And I still want to know what you all think, especially those of you who have not had the opportunity to send in anything. Please, please do. Please participate in this. It's, it's, it's just wonderful fun, I think, for all of us. And if you look at that amazing list of, of melodies, of tunes and suggestions that we got, there's material here for the next several years. And I'm going to take great joy in working through both the familiar and the unfamiliar. And, and we can all talk about it together. So keep on listening, folks. Thanks again. Happy holidays. Let's look forward to 2021. Take care. <laughs>